So I'd like to welcome on to the show, Keris and Susan Ayton. How are you doing? Good, Hi, thank good, you. thank you. Good stuff. Thanks for coming on. Um, I don't know, Susan, if you want to start and just give us your background and then that, like, tell everyone how you've arrived at, well, your own business and where that came from. That'd be cool. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try and keep it as short as I can because I'm quite old now. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, the background's a little bit longer. Everyone likes um, the background, though. That's the thing. <laughs> I, um, when I left school, I started on a course in beauty therapy and I qualified in uh, skincare and makeup and uh, massage, aromatherapy, reflexology, all these different ologies and things. And um, I quickly went into teaching. So I have a background teaching at City of Bath College and Lower Stoft College in East Anglia uh, and also what was Somerset College of Arts and Technology down in Taunton. Uh, but my job very quickly became the writing of uh, exam structures and things like that, internal auditing, all the boring stuff that knits <laughs> together a really big department. So I got quite good at bureaucracy quite at quite a young age. And then I ended up teaching in an all-male prison right, uh, okay. because I had two young children and it kind of made sense that the prison was in town and it was something that I could do. Um, and so I taught that? communication skills. Um, so the prison closed down, uh, oh, I don't know, about six years ago. I did that from 1995 to 2001. Uh, but it also meant that I was subject to being audited by the Home Office and by Strode College, who were the education provider, and also by the prison itself. So I kind of became quite good at um, getting departments ready for audit because uh, we were audited three times a year every year. It was just a nightmare. So there was a sort of bag of skills that came in then. Um, and at the same time, when I was teaching at Bath College, I was approached by one of the directors of what was then Peter Black Toiletries, oh, okay. uh, which then became Lee and Fung, and that's obviously now Mumie. So um, at the time I was approached, I had a group of students at Bath College who were studying beauty therapy, and they felt they would give some value added not only would they just score products, but they would, you know, they would closely analyze them and write reams about how good they were or how bad they were. Um, and so basically, uh, I went to see a chap called Sterling Crew, who was really encouraging, and he's now more in food and beverages. Uh, but it was really encouraging, and I remember taking my two youngest children, who are now directors of the company, to a meeting with Sterling, and they just run ragged around his office and ruined absolutely everything. I was like, just sort of <laughs> never going to go anywhere. I'm sacked before I've even started. But I went to him with a concept to say, yes, I can test your products on students, but I can't do that during my contact hours because I'm a qualified teacher. So I need to do it in my non-contact time. Uh, so put together a proposal um, of how I was gonna actually migrate my business um, from teaching to, to doing consumer studies on students. This was back in the days when I was working on DOS. I had no idea how to use a computer. I had to get a friend uh, from the local council offices who'd actually seen a computer. I'd never really seen one <laughs> before. They come and show me how to use it. And I had one of those big floppy disks that I had to yeah. drive in my car from Shepton Mallet to Trowbridge and hand it in on the reception desk <laughs> for them to be able to read off the results that I'd done on a calculator <laughs> so, and typed in, you know. So it was all very, very Heath Robinson. And then... Uh, I don't know, after doing that for three or four years, um, yeah. I clearly couldn't take my products into the prison uh, and, and test them on inmates because they were for women of a certain caliber who shopped here and had that kind of skin type. So uh, I, kind of put, I kind of put it out there in the community and then had the sort of gestalt moment where I thought I, I know exactly how to write a program for this, oh, uh, except really? for the fact that I don't write programs. Uh, so I kind of wrote a route map for my website, which is called Aiton System Software. Uh, took that to a developer who just got it. He just understood it. So we have the volunteer zone, which volunteers sign up on and profile themselves on. What, six, 700,000 volunteers now all over the globe. We're in 35 countries, 25 languages. Um, and then there's the client. How do you recruit zone. the volunteers? 
Well, historically, I, I literally spent £2,000 the first year that the website was launched. And that was for a global campaign when the only way you could do it was through a specialist in SEO. Okay. Uh, and since then, I've never, ever had to uh, run a campaign like that again because uh, our volunteers are genuinely not spammed. They genuinely get free products. They're genuinely full size. They don't have to send them back. Yeah. They can write the truth about the products um, and they, they're not penalised in any way. Wow. Um, so they, you know, we do, we've got a very, very honest panel. And if we want to grow the panel, we just ask the panel to grow the panel. So most of it is organic. Okay, um, amazing. Yeah, so that, that's kind of how we went from complete poverty uh, to a life of, I wouldn't say luxury, but stability. Yeah. Uh, and, and all in all, that's took about 27 years. Um, so yeah, it was about 1995-ish when we, when we took off big time. Um, and then Karis came on board and she's really <laughs> converted things. So I'll let, I'll let Karis talk about her role. Yeah, um, so I actually joined um, a single research straight out, out of college. Um, so, you know, we kind of were in a small town in Shepton Mallet. Um, so I got to know, college, Karis. Uh, it's a place called Strode, which is in a street. Um, so it's just like some rural summer set. Okay. What did you study? <laughs> um, and I studied performing arts. So nothing to do with what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so um, I'd got to know Sue, um, and so I come on board with her and was working as a study manager. And I did that for a year before going to university to study dance, funny enough, um, but carried on working part time. And it was actually, you know, if we study in dance, I love to dance and things like that. But what I actually found really interesting was exactly what I've been doing at 18 Global Research, which is research. I love researching all the sort of different books, writing my dissertation, um, conducting research, you know, on different types of dance style. Um, and um, teaching as well, so learning about the term teaching strategies that were yeah. involved in teaching dance. So after university, so offered me the job as training director for the company um, to come back on board, which obviously, like I said, I absolutely was yeah, completely, absolutely in love with that because I've been loving teaching, I've been loving research, and that was the absolute perfect pairing. Um, and then so I was teaching, I was basically doing the training for all of the staff, um, but also for the clients and found that there was a kind of gap in everyone's knowledge overall in terms of regulations, okay. especially in the cosmetic industry, but also in all industries. Um, so that was, and that was overall um, with, with the clients and how that married up, you know, well staff's knowledge as well, because generally the data protesting, they're not really thinking about the regulations that are at the end of it. That would be, you know, a consultant's job or something like that, who would tell the client in the first place. So I kind of wanted to bridge that gap and make sure that you know all of our clients that we're visiting understood the regulations about what we do um, and how that would help them you know globally launching their products yeah. and also that our staff were understood like understanding um the regulations that were involved in the so they're putting on the system so that's kind of all married up now so i've become sort of regulatory um specialist with the company and i also say i'm kind of consumer research consultant um because i've kind of put myself forward as a bit of a consultant for the business as well um, in terms of just giving a different service um, to the clients that we have, so as Stu said, sort of doing things like gap analysis, looking at products that are already on the market, seeing if the evidence is there, or if a product's being launched, seeing what not just the tests that we do, but what tests need to be done overall to make sure it can be launched in those markets and with yeah. those claims, basically. And I just absolutely love it. <laughs> it's really interesting. And that's because you really quickly found something you love doing, which was that researching and the studying thing. Yeah, it's, it's not not a path I thought was going to go down. I yeah, I was always a very um, sort of creative person. But then I find this creative in its own right. You know, kind of yeah. making studies, choosing methodologies, choosing the right participants to test the right product for the right claims. Um, so I think it is kind of in a really weird way uh, married up <laughs> that's why i find it really weird when people keep saying to me do you love what you do and it, or, or even a few years ago when i was trying to desperately find a, like what i love doing because i was questioning if i wanted to be doing what i'm doing now because brutally honest i don't I'm, i don't let, live and breathe beauty despite mm. my gorgeous <laughs> looks and that kind of stuff i like it doesn't excite me but it took me a while to actually understand I do really love business and I love helping people in business. Like I love bringing people in within our business. I love helping startups launch a business and stuff like that. So that's why it's really cool to hear that you really quickly mm -hmm. found 
actually the skill bit that you love doing that's, <laughs> yeah. that's really transferable so even in the future if you like you know what you love doing so it doesn't matter what field or if you wanted yeah. to change fields you can look at doing something like that so susan when you were uh, doing the teaching and the prison like when it was all bureaucracy and stuff like that did you love that yeah. that side i i did but in probably not a very healthy way right um, I mean, nobody likes facts and figures, but I liked the achievement. I liked the kudos that it gave me in the department, I think. Uh, I wasn't a senior lecturer. I was just part time. Uh, But I could see some issues. I did a lot of the safety assessments, which is quite challenging in an all male prison. Um, And especially at a time when smoking was allowed, for example, in your classroom, um, when you had to watch for really small things going missing. Uh, like pencils or anything that they could make a weapon out of and things like that you know I mean, it was an enormous challenge for me at the time and I I think I liked combining the reality of the situation with some kind of formal auditing process and and I think it gave my colleagues a lot of um, reassurance that you know you're working in an environment which is okay and areas that aren't okay I've I've raised them as issues uh, before that, we were, there wasn't even an audit system. Even when I started at the prison in 1995, there wasn't. That was one of the first times that we had an audit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just quite interesting to see those days when things were starting to become formalised. And I think talking about skills transfer. I mean, Caris yeah. was saying that she's transferred her skills from her education. Um, module within her her degree in choreography which i have to say she came out with the first class honors in nice. i mentioned that um, <laughs> I'm as well i would have been mentioning that and i have not dropped out <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean you know caris has sort of taken that and she's been able to transfer that and i think that's kind of what i've done really is to say well it's a skill set that i've got has kind of made a bit of order out of disorder Whereas Karis is about taking a syllabus and imparting that onto her colleagues and making sure that they're all qualified or, or at least assessed in the skills that they need. Yeah. The tra- and, and I was so interested in um, your podcast number one um, because that came up time and time again. Uh, oh, with, with Mark. Your, uh, with Mark, yeah. Um, and it just seems to be that until you've gained a variety of skills, maybe business isn't your thing you need that breadth of experience to kind of bang it all together have a concept and and make it run yeah yeah most definitely i was a really fascinated one with mark that is yeah to to get into that bit yeah you've you've got to have the ups and downs and stuff as well as the bureau um the bureaucracy and the audit and stuff are there any really big challenges working in the prison with those type of people that you've taken into business yeah, uh, being a woman, uh, that was an enormous challenge. You had to develop a really great sense of humour because you weren't ever going to win with discipline. Uh, okay. And this was back in the days where my, my built-in cupboard in the back of my classroom didn't even have an alarm bell in it. So I raised that with one of my audits at one point. Um, uh, and you just kind of realised that you had to find a way of controlling a classroom. We had 14 on our roll. Uh, we had glass wall classrooms. Um, but you had to find a way of controlling them with humour. And so I watched a lot of porridge and I developed, <laughs> I developed my, my repertoire of jokes, you know, so you'd sort of do the register and go, oh, you're all here again today. Ah, oh, you know, or the other, the other nasty one was, oh, you got, did you get out of bed the wrong side? Oh, no, you can't, can you? Oh. <laughs> and, and like, I love and the fact you've got office. all the skills for watching porridge. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so you kind of you kind of learn how to cope being in an all male environment, and actually, uh, low cosmetics has traditionally been a very girly thing. Um, the earlier part of my career, twenty seven years ago, most of the people I was working with were men. Um, you know, not in prison, but in boardroom meetings and so on. And it's it, it was challenging at the time. Now, you know, over twenty seven years, I see as many women as I do men, but I really didn't back then. Yeah. I remember saying that actually to my son because he's our, he's another one of our directors. We're a family business. <coughs> and I remember saying to him, it's not, um, it's not a very female business actually, if, if you want to sort of use stereotypes. Yeah. Um, you'll probably end up talking to more men than you will do women. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, we, um, we, we have had that conversation quite recently actually with a lot of people. There's a, 
a few people were assuming the business that I was in was very heavily dominated by females. And actually, from a manufacturing perspective, <coughs> from the areas that I've been, it was very male dominated um, yeah. through like the ops and manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. And even so much yeah. from the sales, but we've got about a 50 50 split now. Yeah. Our, our SMT is 60 40, I think, male to female. So that's getting there. And that's out of 10. So. Well, yeah. I just had a little picture come up on my Facebook and it was my son and I in Moscow seven years ago yesterday. And when we went to Moscow, we went to Intercharm, uh, the big um, beauty exhibition there. And um, so he was 21 at that time. And um, nobody would talk to me because it was an all male dominated, um, you know, exhibition centre. Uh, nobody right. would talk to me. And so I just took up the role of dragging my own bag around. Uh, my own trolley around and let my son age 21 do, do all the talking they didn't want to talk to me really uh, yeah really and and actually up until i would say about four years ago when i was in india doing some lecturing uh in mumbai you, you still got the same kind of thing that you know that a lot of the men there didn't they weren't as comfortable and especially uh, at beauty world middle east in dubai it's still really, you know, there are still different cultures that you have to acknowledge, and that, that's a massive challenge. So who finds it more again, uncomfortable? Do they find it more uncomfortable that they have to talk to you, or do you find it more uncomfortable yeah. that they're not talking to you? I, I don't find it uncomfortable, and going back to skills transfer, I think it is because of having done time in six years in Shatton Mallet <laughs> Prison, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't find much uncomfortable at all in business or life anymore. You get hardened to it. But no, I think it's the... Sometimes the, the male culture, um, it, certainly in the Middle East, they, I think they do find that uncomfortable and it's changing so quickly and it's so good to watch. But, um, you know, it, yeah, I, I think it's the men that are more uncomfortable, to be honest, than the and women. When you were lecturing then, who were you lecturing? Was that males or males and females? It was a mixed audience. It was oh, okay. a mixed audience. But so you still have males a... attending, even though they're going to be listening yeah. and hearing from a female? Yeah, I mean, I still okay. noticed that the audience was predominantly male for my Indian lectures. Um, uh, but, the, you know, the, there was a more equal mix, shall we say, uh, than perhaps in some other countries. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really good to see now we've got cosmetics executive women uh, and the, the Women's Business Awards scheme and things like that. It's great to see that there's more of an even playing field. Yeah. Uh, shall we say. Yeah, I've been... I've, lift some interesting moments <laughs> it sounds with, it with this movement of um, the change in power or responsibility or the ability to get promoted for women um, and of course there are a lot of um, women or female instigated beauty brands now which is great i mean huda beauty is an amazing example of that um, where they're catering to the halal sector and it's headed up uh, by a woman just a oh, fantastic really? example yeah have you had any um probably not quite like that Keris, but have you had any challenges in the job that you're in now that i've, I've actually i must say i've been really really lucky and i always think that generally and since i've sort of started working you know quite you know it's sort of very professional this is the only kind of professional job i've ever had if you know what i mean i've worked there for a long time yeah. and this is what i've done but um like i said a lot of my job role is going to client meetings and going to other countries and things like that um, and generally, I've, I've always been really well accepted, um, which and generally, especially like I do think even when I was younger, sort of like 22 years old and going to a business meeting by myself, you know, with, with some of the biggest maybe brands in New York and um, beauty brands and kind of being in front of um, sort of a big audience like that. And I still think I was well accepted even as a young woman. Um, so I do think I've kind of come into the industry at the right time and maybe into business as a whole. I don't have the same struggles that I know that a lot of other women have had. Yeah. I know that they're still out there. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that in the industry I work in, I think I've been really, really lucky yeah. that I've always been taken very seriously. That's good. Um, but I think also you get what you give in terms of, I mean, like I said, I know every situation is the same, but I think there's a certain, if you've got a certain um, respect for the people that you're meeting and talking with, you'll tend to get that back. Like I said, not maybe not every situation, but certainly the situations that I've been in. Yeah. Um, I think I'm, I've always really prided myself on my kind of people skills. Um, so maybe maybe that's a part of it as well. I think, yeah, I think everything's different. I think we're in a really good 
um, kind of time in this industry in particular, like I said, I think there's a huge balance of male and female. Um, I think looking at kind of my client basis, I think there's, I'd almost say it's 50, 50 generally yeah. of who's male and female and things like that. Um, and loads of different cultures as well, even in the UK, um, there's loads of brands that I work with that have got a very different cultural background. Um, so yeah, I think the whole world is really go, go, going the right way. Um, maybe not kind of in certain countries, if you go there, maybe their culture is different in their own country. But I think certainly there are certain countries that have a very mixed culture. Yeah. Nice, exciting. How do you, um, so going into those meetings when you were just 21, and it's great that people gave you respect, but that's got to be a lot about your confidence. Was, is that down to your performing arts background as well, do you think, while you had the confidence? Because I remember when I was 21, well, I wasn't, tw- when I was 21, I was a complete and utter bum. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wasn't even um, doing any work, I don't think, at that point. But um, <laughs> when I started in this industry, and going into like account management and going to meetings, I must have been about 27. I think something along those lines, but I used to, um, even when I was with people initially, I used to feel really self-conscious, feel myself going red with embarrassment and stuff like that. But you sound like you've just walked into there with these global brands, <laughs> you're like just breezing it. So no, I, d- I definitely don't get me wrong. I definitely, even to this day, I still get nervous. There might be a certain company I've wanted to work with for a long time, and I got to go into that office, and it still makes me nervous. But I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of, especially doing sort of dance and things like that, a lot of it was audition based. Um, so you're going into a room of people you don't know, competing against other people to be the person that stands out. Yeah. And maybe there is a certain part of that that really um, has helped me with that. And, and even things like um, kind of hosting webinars and things like that that we do. Um, a lot of it is a, a performance, you know, you want to make it entertaining. Um, you want to sort of know what you're talking about, be really, really confident. And, and have the confidence to say when you don't know what you're talking about as well. I think that's one thing that's always saved me a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, the worst thing is to try and wing it and sort of go, um, I think it's this. If I don't know something, I'm just really honest. I don't know that, but I'll look into it for you and find that out. Yeah, big um, fan. That's always helped. <laughs> big fan. So, but, um, and then when you get, so you, you're confident. Why were you nervous going in? Even with, So if it's a big brand that you've been really excited to work with and you've, you cracked it like you're not cracked it you've got an opportunity why would you be nervous at that point I, th- I think that's just a general human thing it's like okay. I hope they like me yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know so I get that even meeting a friend that's like, it. <laughs> not even about what you're about to talk about you oh just, yeah like I'm sure yeah I definitely I mean, obviously like what I'm selling as well but you know if people don't like you that you're not going to be able to sell anything mm. um so I think it, you almost you take it quite personally I, I definitely do I take every that's almost a real downfall that I have. And I know Sue knows that as well. I take everything incredibly personally. Like my work is my, um, it's my pride. Yeah, completely. Um, so if I'm selling something and they don't like it, I, I assume they don't like me. <laughs> I feel that. I definitely feel that as well. And despite what I say to people about it's nothing personal. You can, if you can't, it's a, like, you can't have it both ways, can you? Cause I think if you really want to do a good job, you have to care. Mm. But if you really genuinely care, then you are going to take things personally if it doesn't work out. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've definitely been there. Do you have those struggles, Susan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, especially in the early days, you know, we founded our business on, uh, well, our first customer, apart from the contract manufacturer, was Marks & Spencer. That was a big quantum leap from teaching at Bath College or uh, Taunton College. Uh, or the prison indeed you know it's a big leap to actually go into a completely different commercial environment yeah nothing commercial about teaching whatsoever um you know it's a very steady job it's very secure uh there'd be, be, have to be something horrendous go wrong to lose your job as a lecturer especially in fe where you're not you don't have behavioral challenges from from your pupils or students um so yeah the early days were really quite frightening um i think <laughs> I would have been mortified if they didn't like my concept. I'm a very uh, ideas based person. And when I kind of got this concept about what I wanted to make in the way of a website, actually Tesco's got it immediately. And and they started to use our service when we'd only got our volunteer zone built. The other side of it, the client zone, I was still delivering by snail mail or email. Um, 
but they really understood it. And then that felt like a massive responsibility. So I think I would have been more personally insulted if they didn't like my concept, <laughs> rather than if they didn't like yeah. me as a person. But I mean, I, I remember meetings in the old days when people had a bit more time, about 20 years ago, and I would be two hours in a meeting selling what we do in yeah. to, to a team. And that was nothing. And of course today, you're lucky if you get a half an hour window and especially sure. lucky if you get a meeting room. Some of the blue chips that we deal with, you, you might get a corner in an office. Yeah. I quite like that actually. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, it used to be like the entire development team that I'd be delivering my lecture to. Um, and so yeah, you could, there were challenges with that. I would have took it personally if they didn't like my idea because I just knew it was the best way to deliver what was they needed. Was anyone else doing anything close to what you were doing back then? Uh, so no, not at all. Um, I mean, even now, I think we've won our fourth research and development tax grant uh, for Aiton System software. So it's my, my software. We don't. It's not anybody else's third-party software. We developed it ourselves, uh, and we get that grant because it's still innovative. It has to be innovative to be able to achieve aspects of that grant. And uh, so I know what I have is still. Um, all bells and whistles compared to other people's models. Loads and loads of people, of course, do online research, um, but we've got the, big, the biggest database of verified, fully profiled panelists in the UK, but not enough people know that yet. And now we need to get off our backsides and tell them because we're gonna be slightly quieter at the moment. So we need to shout about what we actually do and what we yeah. do well. Um, yeah, so, you know, every, every day is a challenge with it. Um, yeah, we're, we're still at the cutting edge of technology in our field, definitely. Many, many people uh, or companies are doing much better than us in pure market research, that's for sure. But not in consumer studies. We, you know, we've learned the hard way. I mean, one of our biggest challenges um, outside of having to send some appalling accommodation when our travel budget wasn't quite so rich is customs <laughs> and export. I mean, it's just horrendous. Trying to, when you get somebody's development stuck in Bangalore, and you've literally got to get somebody to cycle down there and you've only visited the country twice and argue with them about getting this consignment out. These are the sorts of nitty gritty challenges that we have to face. Um, so we've kind of become expert in distribution for specifically for cosmetics and toiletries uh, all over the world. And I think that's been quite a challenge, hasn't it, Karis? Trying to learn all the ways that we, all the, you know, the ways that we can get products from A to B. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it can still be a challenge in terms of, you know, what's going on now with COVID-19. Obviously, I, don't, I know I don't want to <laughs> get too hung up on it. But yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh... Because we've gone from having, we were, dis we were distributing products to Russia, for example. Um, and a day after we sent the last um, consignment to go be tested, the Royal Mail cut them off. Um, really? So we we were so lucky. Obviously yeah. now we have to wait again for any more. But that you know that particular study um, that we had to get out for our client that we got on the last day. Um, so for, and then uh, same with India, we had um, samples that actually still with we've got a, a partner who helps with, with us with distribution there. They've got the client samples, but they can't get them to the volunteers right now. Right. Okay. Um, and are your customers quite understanding of this? Because of, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, how can't you? I mean, I, it's really not anyone's fault. This is a global pandemic. Everything's do that. And and to be fair, everything else is running as normal. It's literally those two countries that we're having. You know, slow. It's not going to stop. It will happen. They just got to wait a bit longer. Unfortunately, yeah. it's out of our hand. Um. And generally, you know, everything else is is running as normal, which is great. Um. It's it's more for our client side if they've got any hold ups on their end at that point. Um, but there's the yeah distribution's always always fun, um, especially for new countries because as well I mean there's so many countries that we might not even done a study in before, um, but we always say yes essentially if we've got a client that wants to do a, a study in a country we haven't got a panel there necessarily at that time we will find volunteers we will get your products there and we will get them tested that's yeah. very much how you know how we work um, so yeah there's almost every year there's probably something new that we haven't come across before. Um, so there's always some challenges, but it's it's good fun working them out. <laughs> it's all the day you know, when you're sending them out to like Russia and stuff like that, and you you're doing a certain test for a client. Is there ever you don't own that that test result? That's the client, is it? Yeah, I mean, we it's own it until it's paid for. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. But is there ever yeah. a point where you get an inquiry from another customer 
and you think, oh, we've done something similar to that, maybe they'd share the data, or you have to, you literally just, it's all bespoke. Um, they're all, yeah, they're all bespoke, because obviously um, we, do, we do the research based on the product that's being yeah. tested, and the claims that are being tested, so every single study is completely unique. Um, there's no two alike. I mean, we, we have people sort of say, you know, have you got sort of a template questionnaire we can use for this product? But my, my always example there is like, I could give you a template questionnaire, I could make one up, but why are you doing the research if you don't know what questions you <laughs> yeah, yeah, ask? Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. It's, you know, it's based on the claims, it's based on your key market. Um, so I think, especially, you know, we get sort of um, people that contract manufacture forever brands, maybe, and they're like, can you put the, the study through dates and research? Yeah. Um, and that's when we'll kind of they'll kind of be like, oh, have you got a basic questionnaire? But you know, but the thing is, we're always happy to design the questionnaires. If they're, you know, we don't have to give you a template, but you let me know your claims, you let me know who you want to test it on, you let me know everything about the product, and I'll make you a really good questionnaire about it that will get yeah. you those really good claims. Oh, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how we avoid the the um, the kind of scope for sharing, you know, research. <laughs> it's all very bespoke. <laughs> and with um, when you were talking about. Tesco's and Marks and Spencer. When you were new and you were starting out, how did you, um, especially because it was a brand new thing that people weren't doing, yeah. people's time. I, I know people have got less and less time now. It seems whenever you want meetings and stuff like that. But even then, people were still a bit more. It still, they didn't want meetings for the sake of just having a meeting, did they? So how did you convince them that what you were doing, they need to hear and. Getting your I, th I think I just talked until they fell asleep and thought <laughs> <laughs> we better say yes and get her out. You know? yeah. <laughs> Probably leave, leave breathless and blue in the face because there was there was just so much. There is still so much that the software can do, and it was really hard to get across all of the things that it can do. It's basically like the shape of Di a Diablo, if you like, where one end of it is volunteer facing. Uh, or tester facing and then the other uh, side of the Diablo is the customer facing so something that Marks and Spencer or Body Shop or Oriflame can log into and, and they've got a window into that study in real time and then the middle bit is what my staff do to make this bit look like this and that bit look like that um, and to try and explain that and all the permutations of it um, took some time I mean for example we can upload um, an online focus group where we record the scene just as we are today sure. uh, but we can also allow our customer to be the augmenter of that session so it doesn't need to be us that does that uh, and then oh, they can wow. also then immediately download the video and analyze it uh, to pieces they can, uh, at leisure you know uh, and then after that session, assuming that we've sent a product into the home of those volunteers, the volunteers can continue and do a quantitative study after they've already had that experience of being filmed, opening it, and their first reaction to you know, the smell and the texture and so on. They can then continue and say, well, after seven weeks, my skin looked like this or my hands looked like that. After 14 weeks, my skin looked like that, my hands looked like that. Um, so we can kind of do qualitative, quantitative, and we can do it in a store. Um, I remember one store wanting us to go in to um, assess basically the new layout of the store and how it would work um, versus the old layout, and we can do that. We went up to Covent Garden Spa, we did an incredible in-salon study there where we liaised with all of the therapists en masse and their clientele. And so we actually got the therapists as well as the clients to fill in a questionnaire about the experience of this wonderful treatment that they had developed. You know, so it can, it can be absolutely anything. Sometimes we just get a thumbnail of a, of a product design, a packaging design, um, and we might be able to turn that around in 24 hours and people will just look at a series of thumbnail images and rank, preference rank them and say, well, I like this one best, this one best. Oh, brilliant. So or, really varied. I don't know, maybe, <laughs> it's just so varied. I mean, the other the other one was a baby care range where they said we don't know what to put on our strap line. We know what we know we know what we want to call the baby care range, but we need a strap line. So we threw it out to some new mums and said, "What do you want to read at the bottom of it?" And they came up with the creative, and then we gave it back to the designer. So it's yeah, it's hard to kick me out of a meeting, really. No, I get like that when, when you're talking about something you really care about, you just go for it, don't you? you keep going, keep going. Yeah. So, you, uh, so how long? So when you're doing the video call, have you been do, using video calls for a long time then? In your 
business? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the video calls that we do for running the focus group are completely integrated with the concept of a study or a study instance. So, for example, if we had 100 products and we split them up amongst four panels of 25, we could have 25 in America, 25 in Japan, 25 in Italy, 25 in the UK. And we can get various different study managers to manage those populations and then kind of download the video and then continue uh, with the integrated uh, quantitative assessment of the product after that experience is finished. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, you know, sort of how long is a piece of string, really? Um, it's almost <laughs> like a Rubik's Cube, the yeah. software. You can sort of augment it in any direction you want to achieve what you want. Nice. Um, but yeah, like Karis was saying, this, we don't do anything off the shelf. When somebody's poured about between 80,000 and 100,000 pounds into the development of one SKU, which is what I hear the going rate is for a startup brand, they hardly want to just have 14 questions off a shelf that we might have used with six different yeah, yeah. ice cream retailers. You know, it's got, we, we like to learn. Um, we're really intrigued by exactly what we're doing today. We like to learn what has made somebody start that brand up and what their background is and what their passion is um, and what markets they think they're going to sell in. And once we really get inside their head, that's when we can come out with a really, really great study design. Um, and it's not just a sales spiel, but we literally have been able to make claims that have taken people from selling in a local salon or something to having an international deal. Because we, we also know where people shop, you see. We know, we know what brands they like and what their budget is. And so we can really help to steer our clients to say, you know what, you should take that brand to this high street store. Or to this store. You kind of get contacts on all sides, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And I love that idea that you were saying about, you know, um, business is really about, it's about connecting people, isn't it? We sort of had a preamble to this interview. Yeah. It's about connecting people and sort of, matching people and their skill sets up and i think that's kind of what we do in our business in a way uh we exactly. yes we run studies that's what we sell but really what we're doing is connecting people's enthusiasm with their skill sets i, I like how you understand the enthusiasm though as well because we get leads coming through like via email and um, it'd be really quick just to fire off another email but we try and speak to everyone yeah. that literally comes just to understand a bit more about their brand and we just want the fit yeah. to be right really because you, you, yeah. you, you work a long time don't you so you want business to be as fun as possible have you got a um you, enough how many people in your business and how big's your do you have a premises and um so yeah we have a premises um that, that's where we do all of our pick and pack okay. obviously we've had to convert things to have a quarantine area that happened way back in january um, we're lucky in that our software allows the rest of the team, there's 14 of us all together. Okay. Uh, so the study managers, uh, the team of study managers who get to know the clients and extract that uh, story from them and build up that picture of what their aspirations are, they're all now busy working on my software from their homes. Okay. Um, but the packers obviously have to have a physical environment. And it's kind of, we've been so lucky with this COVID situation in that where the office has been vacated by the study managers to work at home, we're now able, we've now got capacity to have three separate packing rooms. Oh, um, okay. so we can still put the throughput through. But our packer, uh, Katie Summers, her name is, and I have to say, uh, her and Jack, who are the last two who are actually office based still during this crisis, uh, need the most massive round of applause because <laughs> they've just been absolutely amazing. The only elasticity has been my uh, my other daughter, who's been able to go in and help in the third packing room. Oh, okay. uh, but they, they've really churned some stuff out. In the last How do you stay in touch with everyone? Um, as teams mainly. Um, so uh, my son Rob has sort of managed all the comms, and we were, by coincidence, almost there just before this kind of hit. Yeah. Uh, we were there in terms of Microsoft in general and all of our email comms. Uh, and then we it, we'd literally just put teams into place as a working model. Um, just before Christmas, we were just starting to feel around saying, well, what's a bucket? You know, how do we operate a bucket on teams? What's the difference between that and a task list and things? Yeah, so we were just sort of feeling away, our way around that when the crisis hit. And 
So I get notifications every two or three minutes. I've had to turn them off for this. <laughs> I've turned off now. <laughs> so we have like a channel for packers to talk to study managers. And so that's pinging all the time backwards and forwards. Uh, then we have a channel which is just for management and that's pinging backwards and forwards. Uh, we don't have one for clients. Clients we're on a sort of one-to-one -one with. So we kind of match up a study manager with the right skill set say for an international blue chip client yeah. uh, or a study manager who's really good at doing startup beauty brands um with, with with a new client so that's all sort of done mostly by email and telephone really and, and of course up and up until well when did we do our northern tour caris was that january um that was uh, february i think we actually came and see, seen uh, some your stuff as well <laughs> yeah tour. we did I think, I think you were well, you one of the Corian, last did you? Yeah. yeah. I think That's our last tour, yeah. Well, who did you see? Laura. Uh, we saw Laura, yeah. <laughs> oh good. Yeah. Well, that was the last time that. we ever last time we ever saw a cosmetic chemist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, it probably is. That's probably the last meeting we actually managed to do physically. Oh really? Um, before I, went, I think, yeah, because um yeah, literally from then, because I, I was I went on holiday and came back to lockdown. <laughs> so <laughs> That was um that was the last one. Did you manage to fulfil the holiday, or were you sent back early? I did. It was very lucky. No, um, we weren't in lockdown here. It's just a lot of other places started going to lockdown. Okay. So we chose to for myself and other people that come on holiday with me, other members of staff, um, to um all just start working from home from then because we kind of knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And we've been through international airports. We we'd, we'd actually been up in the mountains. We weren't anywhere at high risk. Um, not in Italy, <laughs> in the Czech Republic. Because that's the Italy started closing down at that moment. Um, but no, yeah, we just kind of went, you know, let's, let's, um, we can work from home. We, we're able to do it. We can use the software. We started trialing out everything um, that the whole teams ended up taking over, really, in terms of all the procedures and stuff. So uh, I've been working at home from the end of February, actually. <laughs> How are you finding it? I'm absolutely fine. I've got, I mean, I live with two other people who are also working from home. Um, so that's quite nice. Uh, we've got big gardens. So we're very lucky um it's yeah it's not too bad at all <laughs> oh, nice do you normally work from home susan yeah I've, I've worked from home since slightly before 2015 oh, okay i had um there was a massive challenge that i forgot to bring up i had a craniotomy in 2015 um i had a crash on my way home from a corporate meeting with tesco's on the m25 um got took to uh st george's hospital back in london and it's like why am i going here when i live in the southwest and they said oh we think you've broken your spine um put me through a scanner and they said oh no it's okay you haven't broken your spine but you've got a great big brain tumor but it was benign uh and they operated on it in 2015 wow. uh, and so i started to work at home from then onwards really in fact right from my hospital bed really you just can't got to do something you know and I quite enjoy my job as you can tell so uh yeah it, it became a thing really I found I could focus more um and obviously there was a lot of rehab particularly where thought processes were concerned and speech and marrying up concepts and articulating things and being able to sort of regurgitate it was all very uh sort of like swimming through jelly so I'm, I'm quite accustomed to working from home I don't think I because I'm in contact all the time with the staff um, <clears throat> through Teams and Skype and other, you know, other measures. Um, I still feel like I'm sort of intimately involved with the staff. And we do do a lot socially, don't we, Karis? We have some really great, crazy team building days. And I think that's what we're really <laughs> oh, missing great. at the moment. But, yeah, it's usually know, by this good. time. Yeah, about this time every year, we usually do some sort of outside sport or something all together. So. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and how many, 14 people, did you say? Yeah, yeah, we did um, paddle boarding on Bristol docks the last Love time. I think that was our, oh, it was such a great laugh. You know, none of us had done, well, one of us had done paddling, paddle boarding before. Jack had done it before, but he yeah. he went in the drink. I went in the drink. No, um, haven't you? If it's going to be a fun event <laughs> day like that, we um, every year we try and do the same. But we've got two hundred people now. But we have a. Um, oh and I don't know how it's going to go this year, but we had it booked, and in fact, we just postponed it. So we, we will do something, but we might have to do it in four groups if they limit it to like mass gatherings of fifty or less. But we do a sports day. We have like a summer party, and Verity, our HR manager, she um, she breaks up all the teams, so it's completely random across every single department. 
and then oh, you nominate a team captain. So all the senior managements are separated, which is cool. You nominate a team captain, and then yeah. it's super competitive. It's like it's a <laughs> knockout. <laughs> and it goes on all day, and there's like mental games, physical games. And yeah, um, we've been brilliant. quite blessed, actually. It's always been quite sunny when we've been doing it in the summer. And then we just have a beautiful Christmas party. But we're trying to think about what we can do throughout the year. But when you've got so many people, it becomes harder and harder. Oh, we, we, we kind of compete with ourselves, trying to think of wilder and wilder things to do. <laughs> I think my favourite one was, because we're all hopeless on a horse, apart from Katie Alpaca, uh, we, we did a corporate jockey day. It was just <laughs> hilarious. And it's right on the doorstep of our offices. And there's a school called Deboki Riding School. And it's such a lot of fun and it's for novices all the way through to racehorse jockeys. And so I think whether there three teams, Karis, three or four yeah, teams. Yeah, it's three teams. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That's the bit I miss about like, the littler teams where you can do stuff like that. But we're trying to do, think of like splitting the teams up so you can get a group out for a day and do like, you know, those escape rooms and things like that. And... Yeah, yeah, they yeah. good, yeah. I mean, I think like, we also, we usually do a um, Pilton party as well, which is the local uh, for the locals for Glastonbury Festival oh, okay. like a local event a couple of months later and I don't think that's going to happen this year saying that because we usually do that every year there's all the teams sort of go for a big um sort of outside, outside festival as well so yeah it's all those little things this year we're going to miss really and even outside of the team event uh, for Pilton Party a large number of us we, we actually close we have to close down for one or two days either side of the big one i.e glastonbury festival okay um, because the movement of traffic is very difficult and um you know a lot of our staff want to go so we can cycle to glastonbury from where from where we live <laughs> you can imagine how popular it is and of course it's not happening this year so yeah. these are the things that we're missing i think in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of the business, communication, feeling supported. I hope all of those things are still sort of in place, but we do miss each other. Mm. Uh, yeah, we do, don't we? Yeah, we, we sound, like, when you've got a team like you've got where you're doing all this stuff together, it's going to be really challenging, isn't it? I miss seeing people. Yeah, I, I imagine other people are, are feeling very fortunate I'm not there all the time walking around <laughs> just saying hi and giving everyone yeah, a really inappropriate high five or a fist pump or something like that, <laughs> thinking I'm still yeah. in my early 20s rather than just about <laughs> turn 40. <laughs> and are you missing the exhibitions? I mean, have you got like a contingency plan yourself? Because I'm worried that they're not actually going to continue to happen in the... I mean, you look at Cosmoprof, um, 21 halls times two stories, times about 100 exhibitors per hall. Yeah. People flying in from all over the world. I mean, I just can't see that happening for quite a while now. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't exhibit really anymore, actually. Um, we tend to visit just so it's a great place so we can see more people. But um, yeah. The only, I think Laura and her team, they do a lot of um, the formulation ones like Incos and a few other ones. And we go to a lot of... Um, seminars just about regulatory and stuff like that so paulina yeah. who's super talented in our team from a regulatory perspective she can just take in a seminar or take in a big manual and condense it down in a way that i can understand it really really quickly so that's a talent in itself um but i think yeah we'll definitely miss going to going to some exhibitions but it's not massively important so much i don't think for our business I think it'd be the air travel for us. I mean, Karis and I have stayed in many different countries. And uh, before Karis came along, random members of staff, um, not random people, but, you know, uh, in a random fashion, with well-known members of staff in a yeah. random fashion, made sure of that opportunity to come travel with me and feedback to the team what it was like when they went to Italy or when they went to Spain or um, you know all these other countries that we've been to and uh, yeah that, that that's going to be it's going to be hard to really get your ear to the ground without being able to do that travel for a couple of years part of our visits overseas are always to go shopping we always go to McDonald's um, we always bring them <laughs> very cultured um, because we want to be able to see what the differences are <clears throat> between one McDonald's and another. So I've been to McDonald's in Shanghai and in Italy and in France, everywhere I go, because, you know, that we, we do do studies that cater for national preferences and McDonald's are very, very good at it. Yeah. 
Right, right. Uh, and so then we go to um, shopping malls and we find out, for example, in Dubai, we know which shopping malls are for the workers, which are for the rich and which for the super duper rich and so on. And that's a great way for us to profile our volunteers. So if somebody's aspiration is to get their product in a particular shopping mall in Dubai, then best we run our study on people who have got a loyalty card for that particular shopping mall. But, you know, to do that online is just grunt work. But when you're actually over there and you're seeing a ski centre in a shopping mall in Dubai yeah. uh, and a two-storey fish tank in another shopping mall in Dubai, that, that's exciting, you know, that's just exciting. And getting the vibe of the shoppers and learning how they shop differently than in the UK. I mean, it's a very family affair in Dubai. Uh, you don't get people wandering around solo shopping. Uh, they always go in a great big group and it's lovely and it's a really sociable thing for them to do. Um, so yeah, do, doing all of this textbook or, or this kind of research on the internet that, that gives us the insight into how to help our customers being successful is is going to be a challenge are we actually going to do that are we going to sit down and watch street cams of you know people's behavior over the next year or yeah. two or are we are we going to risk it and continue to travel you know i don't have the, i just don't really have the answer I, I love meeting people and that's been massive especially while i've been at orian like face-to-face -face meetings and meeting over lunch and dinner and things like that and yeah. part of i don't don't do it quite as much as i used to now but um Part of the bit I'm concerned about is that more and more people just because Zoom becomes the norm, so yeah. they don't feel that you need that interaction anymore. Mm. And that's my worry. Be like this, and I, and I think it's been amazing yeah. for when you when you have to use stuff like this. And I think for, if you need a quick answer on something, I'd much rather now Zoom someone than yeah. just phone them up. I'd rather just see the face and have a quick chat. And some of yeah. our customers. They think I'm mental. I've been trying to FaceTime them for months leading up to this. Even some of my team at work, they're like, why are you FaceTiming me? I'm just about to get on the tube. And I'm like, just saying hi. So <laughs> I've been like prepping for this <laughs> for what feels like forever. <laughs> but um, you just still can't miss that human interaction, can you? And the meal. I mean, the meals that Karis and I have had, oh, my God. We've <laughs> just had some amazing meals. And I'm going to really miss that. And, and not <laughs> the, you know, the actual food, but the... The social side we made some really good friends yeah, you do though and, don't you and you learn so much more about people when you can just have a chat outside of an office and it just it feels a lot more natural doesn't it absolutely yeah <laughs> the next time you're up you've got to make sure you let me know so i can yeah. actually meet you both whenever yeah, that might be. <laughs> well thanks for your time i've sort of taken up loads of your time haven't i but um that's fine. No, so I, I do need to run away because I have actually got another call at half four. <laughs> yeah, cool. No oh, that's the way it is. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Sue. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Though. I really enjoyed that and it's really lovely to sort of get to know you a bit better. And I said, hopefully we'll um, yeah, be able to come definitely. see you at some point. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thanks both. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Really Take care. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye.